Um, the Royal Bank of Canada? Uh, it's a very private company. Um, it has public shares, but we, we, we know very little. Now, so we can use it in, in, in an administrative sense. We can talk about public and private in terms of the family being the place of private life, and then the economy and public orders being outside the family. But that's not the way I'm looking at it today. Rather, what I'm looking at today is the public realm of social life. Historically, in Canadian cities, social life was lived in the boulevards. It was lived in the parks. It was lived in the squares. In Canadian cities, it was lived at the corner of king and queen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what's happening in our cities? Because of a whole panoply of social forces, which includes secularity, which includes globalization. All of a sudden, the transcendent part of life is gone, and it's the eminent reign that lives. When we control everything, time and space get squeezed together. There is very little public sociability left. We ask that public sociability be undertaken in the school, and in friendship. But the weight is too great. And so, what happens in our cities? When you look at the data, there's a striking thing going on. The increasing number of Canadians who live alone. Now, this has been part of a, of a 50 year movement. If you go back over 50 years, and it's not just Canada, it's, it's also true in Europe, um, the increasing number of people live alone. Now, what's striking about Canada over the last 50 years is that the number of people living alone in Canadian cities has tripled. So, of the 12.4 million households in Canada, 3.3 million of them are people who live by themselves. Now, obviously, Ontario and Quebec have the greatest percentage of those households in Canada. In Ontario, 24% of people live alone. In Quebec, 31% of people live alone. But, but, but then you bring the lens down. And I'll, I'll, I'll own up because I, I want to be particularly uh, uh, parochial here, just because I know the data bit, but, but it serves to make a point. In the greater census metropolitan area of Montreal, 32% of people live alone. One out of three people live by themselves. But on the island of Montreal, it's 38%. Now, my wife is a, is a, is a community development organizer. And in the part of the city where she works, depending on the census district, the sector, goes anywhere between 47% and 55% of people live alone. Now, obviously, the numbers are not as accentuated in Toronto or Vancouver as in Montreal because rents are more expensive in Toronto than in Vancouver than in Montreal. But it doesn't explain everything. One huge factor here is with people 20 to 64 who don't have children or conjugal relationships or responsibilities. What's interesting, of that 20 to 64 year old cohort, one third of them in Montreal stay with their parents. Whereas in Toronto, 50% of them stay with their parents. What's interesting is 44% of them in Montreal live alone. Whereas in Toronto, 27% of them live alone. But again, it doesn't explain everything. When you look at the university, you look at the, the educational data, 50% of people in Toronto that have a university degree live alone. In my city, it's only 43%. But, but here's what's really fascinating, and here's where we get to the crux of community development. One third of all Montrealers who haven't finished high school live alone. Whereas in Toronto, it's only 21%. And then you bring the money in, and here's what becomes counterintuitive. 
50% of people who make less than $29,000 a year in Montreal live alone. In Toronto, it's 33%. In Vancouver, it's 40%. So my friends, journeying in the community as we pursue sustainable, urban, community development, Canadian style, means that we will increasingly be with people who live alone and are increasingly poor. Now, from a purely white, mid-50s, white, Anglo-Saxon male, it doesn't make sense. That's why I say it's counterintuitive. If I'm making only $30,000 and I don't want to live with my folks, which I wouldn't have if I was in my 20s, I got out as quick as I could, but that's a different issue, I wouldn't want to have somebody to live with because common sense says it's cheaper. The problem is I'm one of those people that's got an education. So as we think about this, what, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that public sociability is at an all-time low in our Canadian cities. This is why in city missions, it's so critically important to do the public meal together. This is why in public, in, in city missions, why it's important to have group activities. This is probably why, although I understand why it's done, it's a crime to scare the marginalized, the street people, and the homeless out of our centers after breakfast, but before we open up for supper. Because my friends, we need to create space. We need to create space in place to deal with the issues of public sociability. Again, in large part, this goes to explain the coffee phenomenon in Canadian cities. I mean, I always chuckle when I go to Vancouver. Uh, you know, you can go to any corner in downtown Vancouver, and you've got a coffee shop on all four corners. And guess what? They're all full. But guess what? Those are the people that live alone. And you see, my friends, this is why we need the lens of the texts. Because we're not wired to be alone. We're not wired just for eminence. We're wired for transcendence. And this is where friendship and family and public sociability comes into. So again, I make my point. Journeying in community means we will increasingly be with people who live alone and are poor. And how we do community development needs to take that fact seriously. Now, I, I, I crunch the numbers for my own city. Crunch the numbers for your city. Crunch the numbers for your census sector. I, I must admit, when I did these numbers this week in preparation, although I've been working on this data for four or five years now, it, it, it was so startling in the neighborhood where my, where my wife and I work. Now, what's neat is that the community development project that, that she leads and that, that I'm a part of, we regularly do events with our partners that lets people to sit together for a long time. Now, you do those things too. My, my plea today would be, don't stop. Don't see that as second class stuff. Don't try to get fancy. It's amazing how tea and coffee around the table work. But I think the people that are going to point the way forward on this it is, it is the younger generation. Those younger people that are involved in community development. I have three women that work for me in downtown Montreal. They have a center for kids that are dropping out of school. I mean, they desperately need help to stay in school. As you're aware, probably, uh, Quebec has this pandemic of kids dropping out of school before the end of high school. It's true all across Canada. It just gets accentuated in, in Quebec. But we do a food security and nutrition program at that center. Uh, so, so every week, 
anywhere between 45 and 100 kids come for these food security and nutrition classes. I mean, they do everything from going to the store to learn how to read a label to making a meal. Now, you know what kids, teenagers, you know how they eat, you know, standing up on the run. But, but these three women say, uh-uh. We're going to do the grocery store. We're going to learn how to read a label. We're going to learn how to cook. We're going to do it together. We're going to prepare the meal. And guess what, guys? We're going to eat it together. They're creating community. And this, I think, is part of what we need to be addressing. Because the data that I'm giving you today is about people that are 25 and older. This phenomenon is not going to disappear. So then that would lead then to, to, to the second issue in space that I think we need to take seriously. And that's the just redistribution of resources and particularly the issues of intergenerational poverty. 